And excuse me, I forgot to do something. If you're here in our congregation and this is your first time in Impact Church, do you mind just raising your hand and waving it at us? Yes, thank you so much. Couple, We are so blessed to have you this morning. Amen. Uh, one of the ushers will give you a card to fill out. If you'll please fill that out. Drop it in the offering bucket as it goes by this morning, and we'll sure appreciate it. All right, you guys ready? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. Thank you for the word. Holy Spirit, we totally yield to you. Thank you for touching every heart, ministering peace, grace, and revelation. And I thank you for the anointing of God to break every yoke in this house. We will not walk out in bondage. We will not walk out sick. We will not walk out broken because your anointing is here to deliver and to set free. And we give you praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, this week I was just taking some time really praying about 2023. And as I was, as I was praying about 2023, I began to just receive some words some were exhortations and I just started jotting them down and I just want to share with you this will be a little different this morning I'm not going to have a real long outline of any kind but I really want to share from my heart and just exhort you and challenge you as a child of God coming into 2023 how many of you know the Holy Spirit wants to meet you in a new fresh way he does but he's not just going to manifest just to manifest the bible says those that what hunger thirst after righteousness shall be filled and so i pray that this will just stir up your hearts with a new intense passion for jesus there is such a passion of jesus for us if we if the revelation comes it radically changes your life how many of you remember when you were born again oh my gosh or when you got baptized in the holy ghost sometimes sometimes you think you were floating because your heart was free your mind was free there was a freedom it was like the the spirit of god just sending currents into our soul eliminating the hurt the pain and and the past just being broken in our lives and and that experience you know, it's wonderful when you get saved, but you've heard me teach on this, and I've told you've got your mind has to be transformed. It is just, it'd be great if every time I woke up and the Shekinah glory of God appeared and Jesus was there in a cloud and, and we just did the day together. Anybody ever have that happen? If you have, I'm moving in with you. So, you know, it just doesn't happen that way. And so what happens, the glory and the anointing of God, if we, if we are not renewed in our minds in the Word and we are seeking Him, what happens, you know, that time period gets shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter. And sometimes what happens, we are looking for something in the outward that you're only going to find in the inward. It only comes from a revelation of the Spirit of God. Are you acting on the Word of God? The Spirit of the Lord, I thought about this scripture this morning. This is not in the notes here, but Isaiah 60, let me just, this is a prophetic word. And if there's any prophetic word to me that is talking about today is this. And it says in Isaiah 60, verse 1 and 2, it says, Arise, shine, for your light has come. The light of Jesus is here. Oh, God, come down, Lord Jesus, come down. Well, Jesus said out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. You don't need him coming out. You need him coming up. You need to release what is in you. You know, Colossians 2, 9 says that, we, that Christ was the full expression of God in the earth. And then it turns around and says, and we are in him and have become the full expression. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost dwell on the inside of us. And the more of the revelation that we get of who we are in Christ and what, God, what Jesus has already provided for us, it's already done, 
then what happens, that manifests in your soul. That manifests in your body. And see, the Bible, there is, there's, no, you know, there's no scripture for dealing with unanswered prayer. There isn't. There's no scripture that Jesus says, okay, I know you're going to pray, you're going to be disappointed, so point one, point two, point three, and point four is what happened when I don't answer you. It's, it's just not in there. No, he says, you call, and I will answer you, and I'll show you great and mighty things. And what I'm saying, and here's another thing I want everybody to, there's not one sin you can commit this week that's going to change the love of God for you. Nothing. Now, we're going to make mistakes, and I'm not making excuses for sin, but when you, when you make a mistake, there is a flood of the blood of Jesus that is on the inside of you. And 1 John 1, 9 says, if I confess my sin, he is faithful and just to forgive me and cleanse me. Cleanse me. Cleanse me. That is not only my spirit. It goes into my soul. It's a cleansing. It washes through your body and recognizing the blood of Jesus. And I'll, I'll get to that point either today or next week. But here's, here's what the Lord says. He's saying to us, arise and shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, now notice what he's saying. He's telling the church, arise and shine. The glory of the Lord is on you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people. Now, there's nothing in the Bible that describes to me any more the generation that we live in. Uh, I'm in my 60s, and I have never witnessed the falling of a generation like I have in the last few years. I just haven't. I, I've never witnessed the darkness. I never heard in my life people talking about the need to take the Bible and make it, make it more cultural understanding. Some, some of the politicians, some of the people, that things that I have read, it's almost shocking. You want to take the Scripture and you want to take out all the parts you don't like and you want to form what you call a state Bible based on what a, a bunch of politicians vote on and think it ought to say, can, can you see, in a, we've never faced anything like that. A, 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 just an antichrist spirit against the authorities of the Scripture. And the Bible says the, the Scriptures are God-breathed. They're, they're of the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Every Scripture is of the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And He spoke the Word of God through men inspired by the Holy Spirit. And so the Scriptures are authentic. The thing that you love about the Scriptures, that it was, it was real in the 1900s. It was real to that generation. But you know what? It is real for you today. And it's very personal. Whatever you're going through in, in, your, in your devotion with the Lord, the Holy Spirit leads you into certain scriptures to minister to your spirit, to renew your soul, to grab hold of faith in that promise or in that scripture that takes you through whatever obstacle or whatever thing that you, anything you face. It's because of your obedience and the fact that you know Jesus is in your life. But not only is in your life, he's walking with you through the person of the Holy Spirit every day. Right now in this service, the Holy Spirit has a word particularly for you. And if you come open, you'll receive something. God will speak to you. God will remind you. Anytime I'm not in the pulpit and I'm sitting over here or in other services, I always listen. And if whoever is speaking, and I've trained myself for years. I've done it for years. It's not something I'm doing now. It's just something that I've always done. I, I, I used to have a, a notebook, and I've got, I don't know how many notebooks, full of messages and other things. But most of the time is when something is said. If Philip says something... Matt says something, 
it's in my notes. I immediately go to my phone. So don't ever think he's playing with his phone. No, I'm writing what they just said because you know what? I'm going to go back and look at that. And that's why, because it spoke to my heart and my life where I'm at right now. So in the same way, allow the Holy Spirit, the Word of God, the passion of God to be rekindled and renewed in our life as we move into 2023. And there are things that we can do to get ready for it and desire it. Now it says this, the deep darkness upon the people. Now, you got to love the Holy Spirit because he's talking about, now, here's deep darkness, and I know everybody goes, oh, the deep darkness. But then he said, I don't concentrate on the darkness, but this right here, but the Lord. How many know you just love but the Lord? Will arise over you, and his glory shall be seen upon you. That right there is, is the goal. That's the Christian quest that we walk in such a beautiful relationship with the Holy Spirit that not only is He in us, He is upon us, but people can see Him through us. And everything we do is through the love of God and through the ministry of the Lord. So here's the first word that I wrote down, and it's the word sacrifice. Hebrews 13, 15, it says this, Therefore, by Him... Let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God, and that is the fruit of our lips, giving Him thanks. The word sacrifice is a, is a word that we're familiar with, familiar with. A sacrifice is something that costs you something. But I want you to notice something about the word sacrifice. You know, the Bible, I truly believe, when we move into a thousand years of the millennial reign, we'll, I believe we'll still have the Bible. I believe the glorified saints will preach the Bible, will preach the Word of God to the generation that is raised up during that thousand years. When we get into the eternal kingdom, whether the written scripture is there, I don't know, because we'll have Jesus, the full manifestation of the Word. And then, you know, time is forgotten. I mean, we're, we're shouting in the kingdom forever and forever and forever. And it's going to be glorious. There are scripture that will continue on into heaven, but there are scriptures that are to be fulfilled right here on earth. And this scripture is one of them because of the word sacrifice. And you say, why is that? You won't need to sacrifice in heaven. There won't be any sacrificing in heaven. I mean, you know, when you're in everlasting joy, you ever think about everlasting joy? Man, that'll make you smile. That'll make you look forward to the fact that your name is written in, in the Lamb's Book of Life and in the heavenlies. There is everlasting joy, so there's no need for sacrifice. The sacrifice is here on the earth sacrifice is can only be done on the earth can't be done in heaven we need to all of us provide the holy spirit a place to land on that's what a sacrifice is you know i i always had an incredible respect and love and i read after mother teresa mother teresa in calcutta the the things that she did for the poor and because of the class systems and how that they totally rejected the poor, there was, no, there was no social security. There was nothing for those people. They were thrown to the streets to beg and to die in the streets. And this little woman took it on herself and began to minister to those people. She came to America when, uh, gosh, back in the mid-'90s when President Clinton was in office, and uh, a businessman, a rich businessman, was there, and they were looking at a painting of her or a picture of her, and she has a leper in her arms holding him, and his body is just stretched in her arms. And standing there by the rich businessman, he said to her, I, I, can't, I can't imagine that. You know what she said? I can't imagine not doing it. That shows you the love of God and sacrifice. 
Because when, when God has called us to something, it never is completed until they're sacrificed. And she makes this statement. A sacrifice, to be real, must hurt and must empty ourselves. Give yourself fully to God. He will use you to accomplish great things on the condition, I want you to listen to this, that you believe much more in his love than in your weakness. Isn't that good? Wow. Couldn't be said any better. Man, a sacrifice is when you're so consumed with the love of God, it's like, oh, my God, this, this is a tangible love. It's, it's got to spill out somewhere. I've got to tell someone about Jesus. And this, you know, when you study revival, and I've, I have studied the history of revival, I've preached on the history of revival, the thing about a revival is an awakening. First of all, it's not for the, it's not for the sinner, it's for the church. It's the church that is revived and comes into a new experience that radically meets you right where you're at and hits you so hard. And, you, and it's not God knocking you to your knees. It's you walking in to the manifested love of Jesus Christ. And then that's it. You're ruined forever. You are. The Holy Spirit, I'm telling you, His love and His grace... Let me go ahead and say this, and I'll get to it later, but one of the things that I really felt in my heart, and we'll look more into it, was the throne of grace. It's very interesting, Hebrews 4, 16. It says, let us come boldly into the throne of grace to receive mercy and to find help in the time of need. Now that, and it says before that, we have a high priest who went through what you went through, knows every feeling and emotion that you've ever been through, yet he never sinned, and he ever liveth at the right hand of the Father to remind the Father of what he did for us and the blood. So when God the Father looks at us, he's not looking at you in your weakness and in your pitiful state. He looks at you through the blood of Jesus, and he sees righteous, holy, uh, full of me, victorious. Thanks be unto God that always causes us to triumph. There is no, no place in the Scripture that you are called to live low, beat down, broke, and busted, and, and live in depression and in a, a defeat. No, when you come in contact with the love of Jesus, it destroys all that. It destroys the weakness. It destroys every bit of it. It's, it's what led Mother Teresa into the slums of Calcutta. And so, a sacrifice, but here's the thing about, here's the thing about the throne of grace. Why did he use the term throne of grace? I mean, let's face it, there's plenty of names he could have used. He could have said, come boldly, the word boldly is not being arrogant, it means confident. Be very confident. Come into the throne of of grace. He could have said, come into the throne of the almighty God who created the heavens and the earth, and most of us would shiver at that. Oh my gosh, I'm in almighty and I'm a little peanut, you know. He could have said, come into the throne of his holiness, his purity beyond all that we can ever comprehend and understand, understand, and then we'd be crawling. Because no one's worthy to stand before that. He's God. But he didn't. he didn't. He didn't bring you to your knees. And you know what? He didn't bring you shuddering. You know what he said? Come into grace. You know what that tells me? Man, that ought to it ought to just send you shouting. The fact that I believe, according to that scripture, that God is showing us the very heartbeat is grace, mercy, and compassion. Man, I tried to do uh, a quick eight minutes strong with the armor bearer this morning, and uh, and, and mercy was spending the night 
3.30 this morning. 3.30. I was up at 4. So, and Kim was up at 3.30. So, she was everywhere. So, I thought I could get in a show real quick so I could get ready for Monday. And so, I, I, I'm doing this show. I just started and boom, she comes running up and bounce on my, my knee. And I said, okay, Mercy, you want to do you want to do this show with me? Oh, yeah, you know. So she, this is a child. So I figured I got eight minutes. How am I going to entertain this kid and actually speak to that camera? <laughs> so, so in about three minutes, you know, she starts taking her eye and just doing this real big and doing that. And I said, I said, Mercy, uh, something wrong with your eye? Well, I think I got something in it. Now, that's just on camera. So I said, okay, well, let me pray, and Jesus will heal you. And she says, okay. So she closed her eyes and said, Father, in the name of Jesus, touch mercy's eye in Jesus' name. Amen. And she looked at me. I said, are you healed? And she goes, no. <laughs> now, needless to say, I don't know if that touches anybody else, but that touches me because I was like, you know, a kid's going to be flat honest, you know. So, so anyway, we made it through the course of that. It's pretty funny. And then I did another quick two-minute one. I was going to try to, I thought, man, she kind of ruined it, so I'll try another one, but it didn't last no time. And within two minutes, she was sticking her finger in her nose. So I said, I said, all right, that's it. But... Can I, can I tell you, and you guys know this, the one thing I'm going to hate about that little four-year-old is that little four-year-old is going to come a 13-year-old one day. And I'm going to miss that little four-year-old, the innocence and a love. And, and what God is wanting you to see for all of us today as we move into 2023 is his love and his grace. And for you to go confidently, that child knew she, she, whatever I'm doing, she, she's going to get involved in. But she had the liberty. I didn't say, I'm doing something very holy. <laughs> and you need to go get with your uh, Coco. Go get with Coco. Because Pops has something very holy. I have to speak to the body of Christ. No. And had I done that, had I acted like that, it, that child would have been hurt. And that's what she would have put with religion. And that's why people are destroyed by religion. Because they cannot see the love and the acceptance of a God that's so full of grace and loves us and will forgive us. Look, don't ever let your past, you've heard me say this many times, uh, in my life, someone made this statement, no amount of regret is going to change your past, no amount of anxiety is going to change your future, but any amount of gratitude will change your present. So, therefore, let us continually. Okay, what does continually mean? Well, that means, that means 1104. When we hit 1105, what are we supposed to be doing? Continually praising continually worshiping and a sacrifice a sacrifice of praise sometimes it costs you something and that's when real praise comes up to the father Luke chapter 19 uh, is very interesting when you talk about sacrifice it again can be a sacrifice toward what you're doing for God or it can be a sacrifice to the Lord that you put down or you lay down to give him quality time with you. And, and in Luke 19, it's the story of Zacchaeus. I always find Zacchaeus very interesting. You know, there are two main points that God says about Zacchaeus. Whenever you read the Scripture and he is divine, divi I mean, defining the character of a person, you really get a glimpse. And the two things that he says about Zac Zacchaeus, he is very rich and he is very short. Isn't that something? You got a short, rich man. Now, growing up, if you're short, you gotta, when, when the Bible says you're short, I will guarantee you the guy was short. He probably about, you know, 
four foot nine or maybe five inches. And, and the Romans, you got to think about the Romans. I mean, those guys were huge. And so here was this little short man. There's no question he had an inferiority complex. People always looking down on him and talking down to him. I mean, that's just, that's, that's just the way it is. Now, I don't know if he became rich and a, and a tax collector that if they made fun of him, he was going to charge them double. I don't know. But whatever, he's very rich. So when you're very rich and short, people don't talk about you. How many of you know that? Oh, man. I love you. I love that suit tailored to you. That's just a gorgeous suit. I mean, you just, you're just the coolest person. I love being around you. That's the way people respond. We don't, we don't really get a clue of what happened into Zacchaeus' life. You know, as a tax collector, under the Romans, the Romans despised them because they really were, uh, they were Jews, but they were representing the Romans, so they really didn't have much honor. Then the, the Jews majorly despised them because of the fact that they are taking taxes for the Romans. The Romans wouldn't come in there and take the taxes. They made the Jews take taxes among their people. So if they're going to get mad at somebody, they're going to get mad at Zacchaeus. And somehow in his world, maybe we don't know what state of mind he was in, but I want to say something, and we all know the story of Zacchaeus. What is the major thing that we heard in children's church and what we've heard about Zacchaeus? He climbed that sycamore tree, you know. Can I tell you rich, rich people don't climb trees? They don't. They do not. They have everybody move the crowd, and the people come to them. Because they're secure in their wealth. They're secure in who they are. And I don't doubt that his insecurity complex has probably been settled in the fact that he was very wealthy. And the Holy Spirit took time to say he was very rich. Now, when God says you're very rich, honey, that, that dude had some money. He, he was extremely wealthy. So, but something happened. All of a sudden, the stories about Jesus, the stories. Now, he's Jewish, so he knows of the coming Messiah. He knows those scriptures, and he knows all the reports, the healings and the miracles. And, you know, he didn't need healing. He had everything he needed. Now, sometimes we think the only people that find Jesus are the ones who are deeply in need. And sometimes it's not. Because can I tell you what? Jesus will find anybody who's looking to find him. That's the thing you got to know about it. And so Zacchaeus and these crowds, I mean, you, if you can just go back in history when you watch the History Channel and you, you see like the Beatles and you see these other groups that come to America and the thousands of fans and their bodyguards have to push them every which way just to get them in their limousine to get on when jesus came into town i mean to tell you there were thousands of people thronging him around him because of the miracles and that's why he really kept telling people i'm going to heal you but don't go tell anybody and what's the first thing they did because he knew the crowds were going to limit him and there was a huge crowd and there's no way this little short dude is going to get to the crowd. There's no way he's going to see him. He can't see him because of all the people around him. Zacchaeus was determined, and he climbed a tree. And you just got to love Jesus. Out of all the thousands of people, he's passing, passing by and looks up, and through the Holy Spirit, he didn't know who Zacchaeus was. But it was revealed, but it wasn't revealed the fact that he was a tax collector. It was the fact, man, this guy in this tree, look at that. Probably nobody else saw him. Some people thought, what's the idiot up there doing? You know, oh, that's Zacchaeus. 
I hope he falls and breaks his neck. But Jesus looked at Zacchaeus and said, Zacchaeus, get down. Don't you know he slid down that tree and then everybody backed away. And he, he said, go fix dinner. Me and you're having dinner tonight. And they go in the house and Zacchaeus running around. You know his servants were busy. Man, he was, there's no telling what all he was blessing Jesus with and other things. And then the religious people standing outside. Well, look at him. That man only deals with, he just having sinners in his, in, uh, around him all the time. And Jesus makes it very, very clear. And then you see his heart, you see his mission, you see everything the church is about. Jesus looks and he says, listen to me, I didn't come to seek and to save those who are, don't, don't need a physician. But I've come to seek and to save those which are lost. This church survives based on the seeking and the saving of those that are lost. Amen, Philip. That's it. And because of that sacrifice, he could have fallen. What happened? Climbed up that tree. He got Jesus' attention. And here's the thing sacrifice requires risk. Risk equals faith in action. Jesus stops, ministers to him, goes into his house, eats with him, and. You know what? Then when the end of the dinner was through, Zacchaeus says, Jesus, if I have wronged any man, I will pay him double fold. Jesus looked at him and said, Salvation has come into your house today. The deliverance has come. Now you say, Pastor Terry, what's your point? Uh whatever you have to do to experience a new fresh love if you have to climb a tree climb a tree what's the tree put aside who you are put aside the differences put aside what's going on in your life because let me tell you what happened to Zacchaeus once he experienced the Lord repentance came into his heart and I'll guarantee you when he said that Jesus could have said, all right, let's write them down. The ones who made fun of you and you charged them double, go give them back. And Zacchaeus was true to his word. And, and I, I can tell you, I thought about this today, and you never know, but I don't doubt when we get to heaven, you may find this gorgeous tree house in the tree of life, and it'll be Zacchaeus. What it, what it is... It's he did what was required in order to see and experience the Lord. And, and the thing about Jesus, he's here, he loves us. There's no question his love is equal. Nothing you can do to, to, to put yourself from the love of God. But the thing about it, once your hearts turn to him and you begin to sacrifice, it may be a time, it may be a meal, you know, we'll do the fasting when we start in January, but already I, I challenge you, begin to look at your own life, look at you, and, and ask yourself, do I need to climb a tree? Is there something missing in my life? Do I have a fence over here of those who have talked about my insecurities or made fun of me or have hurt me? And am I trying to, to get revenge on them through other means? Whatever is going on your, in your life, look and realize, man, I'm missing something. And Jesus is here, for your light has come. Arise and shine, for the light has come. I tell you, if the Holy Spirit opened the veil right here, do you know what we would see? 
angels would be all through this room. And there's no question, Jesus standing here in all his glory, in his love, and there's no bat in his hand. There is a love and a grace that's saying, come into, run into the throne room of grace. And you know what it says? Receive mercy. That's kind of funny, me receiving my granddaughter that this morning. Receive mercy and find help. Find help. People will disappoint you. People cannot give you all the things you need. People, in the bottom line, aren't responsible for you as much as we want to feel that they are. No. Receive help for where you're at. It makes no difference how deep the hole is or how deep the well is. The thing is, it's not about the well, it's about the tree. It's about the tree. Father, I thank you for today. I thank you, Holy Spirit. Just let this sink deep in our hearts and in our spirits. Father, I pray everyone in this place, Holy Spirit, you are revealing just in their lives right where they're at and Father, if we've got any religious spirit whatsoever, we repent of it in Jesus' name. We're not going to judge anybody, but we want to see Jesus in a new, fresh way. And we're willing to sacrifice, making the sacrifice, making the sacrifice of praise, climbing the tree, doing whatever it takes, setting time aside and just worshiping you, for you to renew and refresh your love. Come, Jesus, in a new, fresh way. Explode from inside us and through us. For you're here. And Lord, we repent. We just repent anything in our lives. We ask you to forgive us. We ask you to cleanse us. Lord, I thank you. Oh, God, I thank you. When we come into the house of God, we will have already experienced Jesus before we get here. And we'll bring his glory in this place. And now I thank you for the manifestation of your spirit, for healing, miracles. I thank you for it.